It was the first day of my third grade. We were all asked to come up to the front of the class and introduce ourselves. Just the notion and the proposition of doing that made my heart beat fast. My heart was in my throat. My legs froze. My legs became jelly. I walked up to the front of the class and introduced myself. Hello. My name is Amin Ramut Shula. And before I was able to finish the first syllable of my first name, I could hear the snickering, the laughing, and talking under the breaths of all my classmates. Yes, I am a former stutterer. And that event in my memory marked the first time that I lived, that started my journey of living with shame, embarrassment, anger, and humiliation. And that started my years worth of avoidance and endurance. You know, I grew up in Pakistan in the 1970s, and as early as I could remember, that was a culture where bullying, making fun of people, was the norm. This wasn't the current present, where people were more sensitive and attuned to other people's disabilities. I, could, I remember being made fun of in the locker room, in the gym, in the lunch room, in the classroom, Back in those days, that was also a culture where people were, where classroom, where oral testing and verbal skills were very important. You had to learn lines and lines of Shakespeare, lines and lines of your social studies and your history and literature, and repeat it verbatim in class when you were called upon. You know, there were days in which I would feign illness I would wake up with a stomach ache and not wanted to go to school. There were days in which when I was called upon, I stood up on my desk and I wished the floor would open up and I would get swallowed in. And just the anticipation of that hours before would cause me anxiety, would make me break out into a sweat, would make me feel absolutely horrible. You know what I felt was, I felt was, I felt angry. I felt worthless. I felt broken. Think about it as a eight year old, seven year old or an eight year old kid. How would it feel like that you are the one who's defective? You're the one who came up with broken parts. You're like the old car that basically barely sparted to life. And that was really demeaning. That was dehumanizing. And when I think about it, my emotions go back to that dark hole in my chest. You know, back in those days, there was no therapy. There was no self-help books. We don't know what it was. My parents didn't know what it was. They were very patient. They tried to help me. They never completed my sentence for me, just to make me feel that I wasn't like, they never wanted me to hurry this thing through. I took my time, but of course they were parents. They wanted to help me, and they didn't know where. So I remember now, of course, many years later, that this was, they took me to the special doctor. And this doctor, now I know, was a psychiatrist. So I get to his office, and he puts me in a chair, straps me in a chair, and puts a large helmet with wires sticking out. And I distinctly remember that. Of course, now I know what it was. It was a EEG, trying to check my brain waves, like my brain was faulty or something. And it was very demeaning, and it was almost like I was sitting in an electric chair or something, trying to get zapped out. You know, stuttering is a very common problem. 70 million people suffer in the world. What it is, is it's, now of course we know what it is, and it's a block between the Wernicke's and the Broca's area where the speech is formulated and the speech is 
expressed. And those neuronal connections in younger kids are not quite well developed. And that's where some of these blocks occur. And it's usually a reputation kind of thing or an ability to force these words out. Most kids grow up, like myself, grow out of it, whether they basically grow out of it just because they age or they basically learn how to adapt, they learn how to basically improvise. And I probably did some of that stuff myself. Some of the very famous people who have come out and talked about it is the most famous one that you know now is President Biden. He had a terrible, terrible disability growing up and he's very open and vocal about it. Pop singer Ed Sheeran, Julia Roberts, actor Bruce Willis, famous golfer Tiger Woods have all been afflicted by it. You know, back in those days, there was no treatment. There was, like I said, there was no therapy. And I remember that psychiatrist gave me Valium. And I remember my, my mother feeding me Valium. And I felt like hell the next day. I felt like a zombie. And I remember basically trying to keep that in the back of my mouth and spitting it and flushing it down the toilet. And unfortunately, one of those pills that went down the hatch with some water, oh my God, it was awful. I could barely walk the next day. You know, the biggest, the biggest thing that I remember was, the, was what I now call the telephone terror. Of course, back in the 70s, we never had cell phones. So you had the single landline in the middle of your house where everybody was out there and the phone would ring. And guess what I would do? I would run the other way to save my life. I couldn't run fast enough to save my life. But it was so debilitating. And, and think about it, when I wanted to make a phone call, I couldn't do that. If I had to call up a friend and talk to them about a homework, I would bribe my younger brother with candies that he could basically pretend that he was me and he would basically make the phone call and then hand the quick phone over to me quickly. They helped me out. You know, when I couldn't elicit his help, I would lock myself in the bathroom and look at myself in the mirror and practice those lines. I would practice those lines before I would go, before I would have a test next morning in school. And I would practice, I would look at myself in the mirror and I would hate myself. I would hate my facial expression, I would hate the way I would contort my face to get those words out. It was very difficult. But I, but I guess I went through. The person who was my support, was my backbone, was this ramrod of a lady, my grandmother, who I lost last year at the age of 93. This was my last picture with her, just before her 93rd birthday. She, I was, she was 38 years old when I was born. So I put my, my mother literally farmed me out to her place and I grew up at her place. And, and she of course knew what my disability was. She never for a second doubted me, doubted my ability, doubted my ability of my intellectual prowess, never doubted myself and always said, be strong, stand up, look adversity in the eye and face it because you're gonna face more. And what this is going to do for you, it's going to make you stronger. It's going to make you braver. It's going to put you out there. She put me out there. She put me out there. She put me out there for a reason, because she knew that I could. You know, when that little George B, the, 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 the popular kid in the class, didn't invite me for the birthday, she knew how bad I felt. And she instead took me to the park and the zoo and said, we'll have more fun. She hosted my 10th birthday in a two-bedroom dingy little apartment just because she knew that I wanted to be with friends and what it meant for me to be with friends. I don't know if, if, if most of you know that Prophet Moses stuttered too. In the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, Chapter 4, verse 10, he prays to the Lord and says, My Lord, forgive me, for I am of weak speech. 
Before and since you have spoken to me, I am of weak speech and weak tongue. You know, in the Muslim book, the Quran, the same prayer is also present. And my grandfather taught me that prayer, which I recited every night. And that prayer was, Oh my Lord, open up my heart. Loosen the knot in my tongue. Smoothen out my speech so people can understand me. You know, Moses begged his Lord for his brother Aaron, who could help him deliver the message to the Pharaoh. And I pray to the Lord to make my speech smooth and for my brother who would help me make phone calls. The, the defining or, or as you say, the forging, the moment which forges identity, for me for a change was the fourth grade. My class teacher, Mrs. Ahmed, God bless her, came up to me one day and didn't ask me, just told me that you're going to be the main actor in the play. Main actor in the play? I can't even speak a sentence. But you know, looking back, I think I knew what she knew. I know now what she knew. She knew that people who stuttered, when given a chance to act or sing, get better. And that was exactly what it was. My performance was flawless. This was a three-man play, by the way. Three-man. It was a skit. It lasted for 20 minutes. And my school used to be the elementary, middle, and the high school combined in a single room. There was a thousand kids in that auditorium. And I became the most popular little kid in that school. And you know what? That gave me that hope and that sliver of confidence. And I could get over my fear and I participate in oration, in debate, in speeches, in choirs, in plays after that. I also learned how to improvise. I learned how to improvise. I learned how to soften up those hard syllables, those STs and the SQs and the Rs. I learned how to soften up, to skip over syllables. Like, like, I can't remember, but yeah, you could skip over syllables. I would, the other thing was you could, you could enunciate the, those words musically and it would come and flow smooth. Some of the famous singers, like I said, Ed Sheeran could sing perfect. I had to change my accents like, well, can I speak to so-and-so on the telephone? I felt it, 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 it felt smooth. But you know what I felt from the inside? I felt like a fake. I felt like an imposter. I felt like a second person was living inside me. And that's how bad it was. I think I was fifth or sixth grade, or sixth grade, I think, yep, yeah, the start of the middle school. My school had a league, boxing league. And you know, when being bullied, I always wanted to be strong and wanted to just box those guys, basically just punch those guys that bullied me. And there were these set of twins that would come after me in my, on, in, in, during lunch break. They would come after me and bully me. And I would really want to punch them. So this boxing league was amazing. But guess what? I was this scrawny little kid wearing these glasses that could have fit the whole face. And come on, who's going to take me seriously? So I hung out by the coach when I would see these high school kids, these big boisterous high school kids practicing. So I would hang out by the coach. But you know what they say is if you hung out by the barber, if you hang out by the barber's shop, you're sure to get a haircut, right? So I hung out by that coach and he spotted me. And he asked me one day to come and practice when the high schoolers were all gone. And I did. And I enjoyed it. And I could channel my energies on that bag, just hit it hard. And he realized that I could. Or maybe he realized that I was this scrawny kid who lacked self-assuredness and confidence. And he asked me to stay after school and practice. And guess what? I became really good. Those big red Everlast gloves, do you remember those? And I got those and I practiced and I got a silver medal in light feather heavyweight or something like that. And that was really the epitome where boxing taught me self-assuredness and confidence. I never got a chance to box those twins, by the way. 
I don't know where they are, but I'll thank them someday. You know, all through all throughout high school, I was an introvert. I probably became an introvert, but you know what that actually made me do? Was to get strong, to be a better listener. Less talking and more listening. And more listening gave me this uncanny ability to guess what the other person was thinking, what the other person had in their minds. I developed very sharp instincts and antennas. Throughout high school, you know, I kind of learned to live with this. It became more and more as I grew up, became less and less of a, of a debilitation and more and more of a menace maybe. At the end of high school, my principal called me up the following week and asked me if I could come back and teach physics and chemistry. That was the highlight of my high school years. Of course, I took every opportunity during medical school, college and medical school to sign up for activities that meant public speaking. And I enjoyed it, really I enjoyed it. Three years ago, I was invited by Kerry Miller on her morning show to talk about physician-patient communi physician communication. And that was wonderful, speaking with her live on, on the radio. I was also awarded by Alina Health five years in a row, Physician Communication Award, which is awarded to the top one percentile, one percent of physicians in the, in, the, in the nation. Physician communication? Isn't that kind of a oxymoronic statement here? Communication for a guy who couldn't even complete a sentence? And of course, I was also very fortunate this year and honored to be awarded as the top doctor by the Minneapolis St. Paul magazine this year. You know what, it did, what this did was as a listener, as less of a talker and a listener, what it really forced me to do was to become empathetic, to be kind, to be gentle, to be more attuned and more sensitive to people's pains and disabilities and their diseases. I think I became a better person. But I also know one thing that this disability that I had, that I grew up with, never defined me, never defined me as to who I was. And my grandmother always told me that. It has nothing to do with your heart, with who you are, with your intelligence, with your ability to learn things, with your core values, with your character, with your morality, with your goodness in your heart. It had nothing to do with that. What I did learn was to, to get over that disability, I had to work hard and be the best at whatever I did. And I knew I could do that. Nothing would block me. Nothing would stop me. I was a mean machine. I would work hard. I had that grit. I had that perseverance, that persistence that is needed to basically stand tall and face up. And that was important. You know what that really taught me? Was a courage that no life lesson will teach you. Today, I'm going to say thank you to those twins who hounded me. Thank you to George B. who didn't invite me to that birthday. And I'm going to tell you all, never, never, never give up on things that seem insurmountable or a block in your life. Never give, the, never give up on things. Denzel Washington in one of his convocation speech said, there is no option of falling back. You fall forwards and I fell forwards and I got up and I brushed and I moved on. And Andrew Solomon, look up Andrew Solomon, one of the most inspirational speakers that I've listened to in his 2014 TED talk said, none of us embrace pain and misery for shaping our character as to who we are, but we make the best of our identities, of our personalities in wake of hardships, and that's important. And I told Rebecca, the first speaker this morning, the three Fs, be fierce, be fluid, adapt to difficulties, adapt to changes, and be forgiving. 
So I forgive my tormentors. And what I, what I do also know that you shape your destiny. I tell my kids a very famous line from a poem where it says, before destiny, raise yourself, elevate yourself to a point where before a destiny is written for you, destiny asks you, how would you like your destiny to be written? And that is, that is important, and I'm going to end with this. Every trial weathered and endured makes the soul stronger. And what's important is that this gave, gave me a chance to wrap my misfortune into a narrative about victory, about triumph, about endurance. And I ask you to do the same. When Teres asked me to give this talk and the topic was rewriting your narrative, it gave me a chance to think this through. Bring the past memories out, forgive the people and move on. I wanted to thank my parents for being patient with me and for doing everything what they have and my wife out there. She stood by me in thick and thin through the journey what we call life. And my kids, I'm in complete awe of you all for what you bring in my life. Your great heart, your intellectual prowess, your good looks, I wish I could have those, and for all that you do. And thank you all for listening. Thank you.